Hello, and welcome to Yesterday, Today, and Forever, a virtual ministry of the Churches of Christ. It is our desire to present to the 21st century person the faith of the first century Christians. We seek unity through the acceptance of the faith that was once and for all time delivered unto the saints, a system of faith which first began to be spoken by our Lord prior to his crucifixion and was later confirmed to the saints by the apostles and inspired writers of the New Testament. Thus a faith from yesterday, to today and into forever. Our speaker is Brian Barrett, who preaches for the church at Bear Branch, in Spurlockville, West Virginia. We encourage all persons interested in the faith of our fathers, to open their Bibles, as we search the scriptures, for these eternal truths, which can lead Christians back into unity as the family of God. Now, here is Brian. We're studying this morning from the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. As we were concluding the fourth chapter last week, we were considering the fact that Jesus had been made a high priest. And as we come into the fifth chapter, uh, this morning, as we know it, we uh, see a introduction as it applies to the priests of the Old Testament or the high priests uh, under the Old Testament, beginning in verse uh, 1 through 4. And then it speaks concerning Christ and His priesthood. As we look at these verses, we should note that uh, these first four verses speak about prerequisites uh, for the priesthood. Uh, and it lists uh, in here or discusses in here four specific things. The priesthood required that the priest or the high priesthood, either way, to be human. Uh, that he belonged to a priestly order. That three, he be compassionate and sympathetic to the things of the people. And number four, that he be appointed by God. As we look at this, we can see uh, the earthly high priest under the law of Moses as opposed to, we've been talking about on and off, the angelic host and why Jesus came in the flesh and why He wasn't an angel and why God did what He did. And we kind of find more of an explanation uh, in these things. It was God's intention that Jesus should become a high priest. But uh, as of a priestly order, uh, he was of the tribe of Judah, and so uh, the tribe of Judah was not included in the Mosaic priesthood. And so there are various issues that have to kind of be dealt with as we go through this uh, short, as we know it, 14 verses in the fifth chapter. And so it says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin, who have compassion on the ignorant, on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins." And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. And so this addresses those four points and why those four points existed. 
And so the high priesthood uh, is and does require one to be of human status. Uh, even the priesthood of God preceding this under what we think of as the patriarchal age, the eldest patriarch of the family was the patriarchal priest of that family. And then there were other priests who ministered and offered sacrifices and dealt with others. And so whether we're talking about the patriarchal period or whether we're talking about the law of Moses or whether we're talking about now the Christian dispensation, it requires a human priest, a human high priest to deal with the people. And of course, uh, the, uh, there were various conditions, of course, that... Uh, that established one uh, as a priest, especially under the law of Moses, which we're comparing Christianity and the law of Moses. Um, they had to be of the lineage of Aaron uh, and of the Levites. The priests had to come from the Levites and the high priests had to come from the family of Aaron. Uh, and so as we look here, uh, He is ordained for men. Notice the way it's written. He is ordained for men, not ordained by men. There's a difference. Being ordained by men uh, today in many of the uh, religious uh, denominational world, preachers are ordained and they are ordained uh, by men, by conference, through some earthly means, they must meet some kind of earthly conditions in order to be ordained uh, into that particular fellowship and to be able to minister uh, to those individuals. But here it speaks about the high priesthood is something that is not determined by men. It never was determined by men. He, they were selected. Uh, the uh, guidelines were given by God in the law, and God determined who would be the successor to the high priest, which indeed would be uh, the eldest son, the patriarch in essence, of the family. And so even under the law of Moses, there are still certain patriarchal conditions and circumstances uh, that exist. And so uh, it's taken from among men, therefore human, and he is ordained for men based on God's conditions that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sin as a purpose or intent for that. Uh, and so uh, we see the compassion and, and being sympathetic in that uh, He can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that He Himself also is compassed with infirmity. The high priest was uh, not excluded from, yes? Well, it should have, but uh, by the time Jesus comes along, the high priests were appointed by uh, the Romans and set in place. So there was, during the time of Jesus, we see Annas and we see Caiaphas. Uh, one of them was the what we would call the legitimate high priest under the law of Moses, and the other one was politically appointed uh, by Rome. And Rome dealt specifically with the high priest that they appointed, whom they believed, I suppose, they could control and make sure that they did what the Romans wanted them to do, rather than setting someone in office for 
uh, a lifetime. But the Jewish people still honored the law of Moses, and so they established the office of the high priest according to their terms, and then the high priest according to the Romans. And so uh, there was two high priests serving at the same time. But that wasn't consistent. That part of it was not consistent with the law of Moses, but that was not something that the Israelites determined so much as what the Romans, who were uh, their overlords, if you want to call it, did. Just made me think of a conflict of interest between the two. Yeah, and you know, I I suppose they're probably in the appointment of the high priest. There was some wheeling and dealing, I'm sure, when it comes with with the Romans and and all of that. <clears throat> But the, uh, the reason that God appointed them to come from humanity was that they could have some compassion and sympathy uh, with those who they were ministering to God for on their behalf because the high priest, the human high priest under the law of Moses on the Day of Atonement had to offer a sacrifice for his own sins first. And he had to make uh, atonement reconciliation with God for himself before God allowed him to make atonement uh, for the children of Israel. And so he expected God to have compassion on him uh, because of his weakness, because of his infirmities, because of his lack of perfection surrounded by uh, infirmity, that is a weakness of the flesh, not necessarily a physical sickness or infirmity, but uh, the condition of humanity about being drawn away by our own lusts and ties. Uh, and so... Uh, by reason thereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sin. And so one of the conditions is that you don't put someone in charge uh, of the priesthood, the high priest, who can't be touched, does not have some type of compassion or sympathy. If we were to send an angel to serve as the high priest or some other uh, heavenly being, you know, the cherubim were there on the mercy seat. God could have sent a cherubim or a seraphim to minister in the Holy of Holies and serve as the high priest, but they would not understand the infirmity of mankind the physical temptations, uh, and so they would not uh, be able to appreciate the condition. Uh, and so humanity was designed and determined. Uh, and again, no one takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as Aaron. And of course, as I said, Rome, uh, later on, when they took power over Israel, they appointed a high priest, but the people of Israel had their own high priest uh, for a lifetime following the custom of Moses. And so rather than allow Rome to re totally replace the high priest, uh, and therefore violate the conditions uh, and they went back to and, and followed so that that's why there was two high priests. Anything down through four? As we come to verse five, it says, so also Christ. So based upon those points that were made, uh, concerning especially the law of Moses, so also Christ glorified not Himself, 
to be made a high priest. Becoming a high priest and assuming the high priesthood was not something that Jesus determined for Himself. No more than Aaron made that choice that he would be the high priest. And so, uh, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so Psalm 2-7 is quoted in verse 5, and Psalm 110 verse 4 is quoted in verse 6. So the question is going to come up, Jesus is of the tribe of Judah, and so uh, how exactly is it that Jesus gets to be high priest? And so the explanation which is given by the Hebrew writer and should be accepted uh, through the church is that this honor of being appointed a high priest before God was not something that Jesus did, but God the Father, first of all, said to Jesus, His only begotten Son, Thou art my Son. And so he was made a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And of course, Melchizedek was a patriarchal priest, and he was not uh, a priest under the law of Moses. He was the king uh, of Salem. Back in the Old Testament, when we read about uh, Abraham, after the battle of the kings, uh, we see that uh, he met with Melchizedek and Melchizedek blessed him and he gave a tithe of the things which he possessed to Melchizedek. And we're told that he was a priest of the Most High God. Uh, and so he was the uh, king of righteousness, word Melchizedek, Melchizedek comes from Hebrew, which means uh, king or ruler of righteousness. And he was also the king of Salem, uh, Shalom, which is peace. And so Jerusalem. Uh, and so uh, we, we have those concepts. So when we're saying, yeah, wait, wait, but Jesus isn't of the tribe of Aaron. Uh, and therefore, he doesn't meet the qualifications like whoever the high priest was at the time this book was being written. And to meet those qualifications, of course, Jesus was his only begotten son, so he was human. Uh, as far as a priestly order, even though he came of the tribe of Judah, he was of the family of God. And God the Father appointed him as a high priest, not just over Israel, but over all, not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. And of course, people have looked at these terms, king of Salem, uh, king of righteousness, whether or not these are actual names is questionable. We use the term Melchizedek, but whether that's a proper name or not is debatable uh, because uh, he was the king, the ruler of Jerusalem. And at the time we're talking about uh, these walled cities were kind of like city-states. They had their territory and they had their king. And Melchizedek was the king who ruled over Jerusalem, or he was the king of what would come to be known as Jerusalem. And he was also uh, the ruler of righteousness. That's what his name means anyway, Melchizedek. Uh, and so Melchizedek becomes uh, symbolic of Jesus 
Jesus is the King of righteousness, and He is also the ruler of peace. He's the King of peace. He's the uh, ruler or king over righteousness. And so those titles or terms that were used for the individual who met with, Ab- or met with Abraham, whom we know as Melchizedek, uh, Jesus was appointed after that priesthood. And of course, uh, how exactly Melchizedek came to be the priest of the Most High God and how he came into that particular position, uh, we don't have a lot of information as to how exactly uh, that happened other than the fact that he was in some way appointed by God to fill that capacity. And so Melchizedek, in essence, would have been a Uh, high priest, not of just one particular uh, family, but he would have been a priest over the families. And at that time, we would think of them as Gentile families. And so uh, he was a priest of all, not limited just to the people of Israel. And so Jesus was made a high priest, not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. And so he is a high priest overall. And so verse 7 says, "...who, being Jesus, in the days of His flesh, when He offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto Him that was able to save Him from death, was heard in that He feared." Now, it's making reference there, of course, to the the prayers that Jesus had offered up in the garden on that night that He was betrayed. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from Me. He was praying if there was any way possible, let this cup pass from Me. And of course, the answer to that is there is no other way. And so God heard him. He sent an angel to strengthen him. We read about in the Scriptures. And so we're told in verse 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And so as hard and as difficult as the cross was, and the prayer that Jesus made, He learned obedience in the things that He suffered, submitting Himself to the cross and to those things which were the will of God. And being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. And so He made an offering of Himself for the sins of all the people, And because He was sinless Himself, uh, His sacrifice like the Passover lamb, uh, when God sees the blood He passes over, He's able then uh, to bring people into a relationship with God, both who have never been saved and also those who have sinned since they were saved. And so in a certain way, when we think about the Day of Atonement, every year there was a time that people had to consider themselves and their relationship with God and make atonement on the Day of Atonement for those sins. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, now as we partake of the Lord's Supper, as we consider that sacrifice, we ought to examine ourselves Uh, look for our weaknesses and consider how that through repentance and prayer and and a rededication for that week, we can better serve God. But, you know, when we look at this verse, verse 8 is a very strong verse. 
mean, when we hear things in the New Testament about being obedient to the Gospel, that's as long as it's convenient, right? I mean, when it's inconvenient, we don't have to do that, right? The example that Jesus sets for us is no matter how inconvenient, no matter how painful, no matter what the sacrifice that is required, we must be obedient to God. When Peter was threatened in the early days of the church, him and John were threatened and, and ultimately beaten. He, he said, you know, we ought to uh, obey God rather than man. And so, though he was the only begotten Son of the Father, unique in all of history, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. Things can be very uncomfortable. Things can actually take our life, cause our life to be taken. Persecution. Many of the Christians in the first century suffered persecution. And I fear today that we're a short ways from that again. In many places around the world, I constantly hear from churches in Africa that are being persecuted. I hear from churches in the northern part of India that are being persecuted. Uh, they have actually been in service on the Lord's Day, and some of the Hindus have taken backhoes and literally pushed the building down around them. And they either had a choice to stay there uh, or leave, but it's the world is getting to be a dangerous place for Christianity and those who serve Him. And so we have an example that even though He was a son, yet learned He obedience by the things which He suffered, and that perfected Him. That made Him perfect and complete as a high priest, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So the question comes up, you know, how much do we have to obey? All the way. Whatever the price, whatever the cost, you know, people say today, you know, well, if we don't change the way we do things, we're going to lose everything. We can't change the gospel. Paul says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we've preached, let him be cursed. And we don't have options. The only option we have is either to obey or disobey. We can't really make excuses or try to make excuses while we uh, do this because Jesus gave his life. His all to complete His obedience to the Father. And so, if you ask Jesus, what does complete obedience, what does it mean to obey? Jesus would just point to the cross. And that means giving your all. And so, He did that. And so, uh, He says, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we could go into a long discussion, and I'm not going to do that, but in the book of Galatians 3, if you want to take time to read that chapter, you find that the law of Moses is inside a bubble. And that bubble is the bubble of the patriarchal age. The law which was given at Mount Sinai, according to Galatians 3, cannot make null and void the promises that were made to Abraham and others under the patriarchal period. And so the, we like to think of things real neat. We like to think about there was first the patriarchal age, then there was the age of Moses, and then there was the age of, of Christianity. And, and that's, I mean... To make it quick and easy, yeah, that works. But during the, the mosaical dispensation, during the time of the law of Moses, 
the patriarchal system was still going on among the nations. Now, we don't have a lot of information about that because the Old Testament is predominantly written to us by Israelites dealing with the history of Israel and the keeping of the law of Moses. But we do have hints and pieces in there of where God was dealing with others, just like God sent Jonah to Nineveh, which was not a city of the Jews, but He sent uh, him there, uh, sent Jonah there to preach uh, about repentance and God's judgment. And so Jesus is by God appointed a high priest, not after the order of Aaron, which was in a little bubble of time among a specific people, which was the Israelites, but He made Him after the order of Melchizedek, which covers the entire patriarchal period, which would have really went back all the way to Adam and Eve, all the way up until the time that the church was established. Does anybody have any questions or comments through verse 10? Now, this brings up a whole can of worms, as I said. We could spend a lot of time talking about this. And that's exactly what the Hebrew writer says concerning Jesus being called a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. These Jewish people uh, weren't as eager to hear things and understand things as they once were. Their hearing was beginning to dull down. Just like Jesus had said before, they, these people's heart is wax gross. They've, their ears, they've closed. Their eyes, they've closed. The Hebrew writer says, we could discuss a great deal. And we have a lot that we could discuss about the patriarchal priesthood and being made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We have many things that you know, we could discuss that connect to this matter. However, seeing how you've chosen to not be so eager to learn and to hear and accept, uh, it's going to be hard to... Uh, accurately discuss that in this particular letter. Now, he will, at places, uh, talk about Melchizedek. But here's another one of those places about what could have been. You know, everybody uh, has ideas about Melchizedek because of some of the things that are said in Hebrews and some of the things that are said in other places. Uh, the Jews have their traditions about who Melchizedek was and where he came from and who his lineage was. Even the Masonic Lodge has a uh, teaching about Melchizedek and who he was and where he came from. And so a lot of people have attempted to understand Melchizedek and his place in the history of things and why it is that Jesus was made after that order. And so the Hebrew writer says we could, we could uh, discuss a lot of things, but I'm afraid you wouldn't be able to understand or you wouldn't accept them at this time because your heart and mind is, is just not correctly prepared for that. And then he scolds them. In verse 12, he says, For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. 
Sadly, that's the church today. A big majority of the church today, when you run into some of them, are really not fully convinced that instrumental music is wrong. They're not fully convinced that the church of Christ is the only church. They're not convinced of many things. And so therefore, uh, you know, people, even when it comes to baptism and various other things, they're not as convinced as sometimes we would think they are when it comes to the doctrines and teachings. And because these people here had dulled their ears and were leaning back to other things, the Hebrew writer says, you know, you've been at this long enough that you should be teachers now. You ought to be teaching the Word of God to others. You ought to be able to explain the Word of God clearly to others. And the shame is uh, you have need of one to come back and teach you again of the very basic, what we would think of as first principles of the oracles. That's the Word of God. And it will come as such that can no longer handle meat. That's why I can't talk to you about Melchizedek because that's a, that's a meaty matter. That's, that's a lot of stuff to chew on and you don't have the teeth to do it with. So I got to plug this bottle in your mouth and try to nurse you back and, and get you moving in the right direction again. And he says, for everyone that useth milk, is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. As Peter says, we expect those who have obeyed the gospel to desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. But notice emphasis on grow thereby. We expect, the Bible expects, the apostles expect, the Holy Spirit expects that we're going to grow to a point where we have understanding uh, that we are no longer babes. There comes a time that when you're 18, you're expected to be handed a diploma because you have spent 12, 13, 14 years going from kindergarten, preschool, uh, all of that up Two, graduating from high school. It's expected that by the time you hit 18, somebody's going to be putting a diploma in your hand. You know, not be like Jethro Bodine who uh, spent 12 years getting through the sixth grade or whatever it was that he did. Still unskillful in, in many things. And so we expect our children we expect people in the world when when we see someone who's crossing the graduation line who's in their 20s or 30s or 60s or whatever again that's a good thing but we got to ask what happened in between because that's just not the norm and so the hebrew writer says there's certain norms that we expect and our expectations at this time is that you ought to be leaders, you ought to be teachers, you ought to be able to handle the Word of God aright. But then finally in verse 14, he says this, but strong meat, things like discussing Melchizedek, the patriarchal priesthood, how the patriarchal priesthood and the mosaical priesthood could all function at the same time. How is it the strong meat belongeth to them that are a full age, he's talking there spiritually as well as physically, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And they're not there. They're turning their back. They're going back to the law of Moses. They're abandoning the things of 
Jesus and many people today have left the New Testament, even those who were part of the restoration movement, part of the concept of New Testament Christianity. Many of them are going back and joining themselves to the same denominational world that we uh, separated ourselves out from hundreds of years ago as we began to pursue uh, the strong meat of the Scriptures. Why not make this the day that you and your family seek out the Church of Christ in your community? We encourage you to attend one of our worship times or Bible studies. God's grace, truth, and salvation is truly worth finding and knowing. May God bless and keep you as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you. Our new programs are posted to Facebook and YouTube on Thursday afternoon and they should be available for viewing by 7 p.m. We also encourage our viewers to visit our website at www.thechurchesofchrist.life. We ask that you like us on Facebook and share our programs. On YouTube please share and subscribe for notifications. This program was pre-recorded.